Welcome to the Infamous Ghost Podcast. I'm Sellers. I'm Josiah. And this is where we give you our weekly perspective of pop culture, sports, and entertainment. Josiah, what's been going on with you, man? How your week been? Oh, shit. My, my week been decent, honestly. I've been keeping up on a, um the news lately. You see Disney dropping some projects in the future? Like, it's rumored they come out with a Toy Story 5, and I feel like yeah. they don't need that. Yeah, I saw they that. It's coming out in 2025. That. Bro, you, uh, they milking that cow because I think Toy Story 4 was like the mo- one of the most streamed movies on Disney+. Plus. And to unpopular opinion, I feel like we didn't need Toy Story 4. Yeah, Toy like, Story 3 is the perfect ending. Perfect ending. Andy went off to college. The toys got a new owner. Boom. But Toy Story 4, it was still good. Don't get me wrong, but it was such such a reach. Yeah, I mean, shit. Actors still got paid millions, but... Just imagine getting paid millions to go hop in the studio, like, mm-hmm. the, like come on, <laughs> there's a snake in my like. How? Literally, I like mean, Tom Tom Hanks, man, he he got to back off that. Nah, for real, man. But nah, that just show, that just goes to show you how people really love franchises and want to see more of those. And man, it, as long as as long as they keep getting streams like that, mm-hmm. I keep making them. Like, why yeah. not? Yeah, but I feel like. You you gotta let it go at some point because Toy Story came out in the nineties, like ninety five, if I'm not mistaken. Like yeah, like the first animation movie ever. Yeah, so at one point you just gotta like close that book on that. You just gotta close the book and come up with a new story. And I feel like that's so hard for Disney right now. Like you're right, man. And talking about all this animation, the voice acting, it's crazy because our next guest, Mm. if y'all didn't know, is none other than Paul Rugg. If y'all don't know, Paul Rugg is a huge figure in the animation world. Man, he's worked with Warner Bros. in the 90s. He got his start on Animaniacs. He's done many voiceover roles. He's done writing. He's created his own shows. and just has so many characters inked and stamped into the animation world. And we're so lucky to have him on our podcast. Man, I, I'm I'm shocked by all the guests we've been having on, bro. I just this is such a small podcast, and like just people willing to come on our platform is huge. I'm excited for this one, man. But but yeah, Sellers, so this is a big one. And you met him at Twin City Con, if I'm not I'm, mistaken, I, right? So, I, so first, I, I met him in Des Moines Con back in June. Cool, gave me an interview, man. Dope to see him. I was talking to him for a few minutes, him and his partner. And and then I met him at Twin City Con in uh, Minnesota, and that's when I I just jumped the gun. I, said, I asked for his email. I'm like, I wonder if I can get him on a podcast. Because he just has so many stories to tell, and I, I just know our audience love to hear it. Oh, yeah, for sure, because if you just look at his work, he's been doing this since the 90s. And yes. if people don't know who he is, you for sure know his voices. Yeah, let me na- let me name out some of the work real quick. So he's worked on Animaniacs, Freakazoid, Hysteria, Dave the Barbarian, Secret Mountain, Manning the Uncannies, The Sam Plenty Calvacator Action Show, plus singing, American Dragon, Jake Long. That was one of my favorite shows on Disney, man. But uh, without further ado... Let's bring him in. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Hey, yo, how you doing? How you good. doing? Good. How are you? We will be blessed. I can't complain. Uh, good, good, good. Yeah, so tell us, how how life going? Yeah, it's going good. I'm just having my Topo Chico, which is the water of champions. I don't know if you guys know that, but it's <laughs> water of absolutely champions. amazing. I have math that on my grocery list. Yeah, Hopefully Topo Chico. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't think it does, but it's it's... It's got more fizz than you could possibly want. So don't don't drink it and then have a, an activity. Otherwise, your your head will pop off. But uh, okay. other than that, it's fine. That's yeah. Good. All right. That's <laughs> enough. And we're so, so honored to have you on today, man. Been wanting to talk to you for a while, and we're just blessed to have you here. Oh yeah. Well, thank thank you very much. It's a good it's a good way to end the week. Thank. You. Oh yeah. Yes, so, for sure. Unless you work weekends, but yeah. Well, that's true. True. Well then, it's a it, it's a good way to end the Friday. Then how about that? There we go. That's a better okay, way. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. There you go. All right. So, anything new with you? You still traveling uh, for conventions? Yep, 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 yep. Um, we just got back from Florida, uh, Central Florida Con. Um, and uh, yeah, just doing doing that, and uh, yeah, okay. that sort of thing. Hold on, the dog wants to come in. I'm very sorry. Hold on. Uh-huh, no problem. Uh, you good? Come on, come on in. Otherwise, she barks. Go on, sit down. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay. Well, yeah, I was going to ask, um, how is it 
still traveling to conventions like after all this time and like people it's still weird. remembering your voice. Yeah, it's it's weird <laughs> um, because uh, like Freakazoid, I think. Well, and Animaniacs was we premiered in ninety three. Um, uh, Freakazoid premiered in ninety five. Uh, we were we were uh, unfortunately canceled in ninety seven. Uh, but then I've done like uh, for Dave the Barbarian for um, Disney Channel, Artifius and Puss in Boots on Netflix, The Adventures of Puss in Boots, which were, and and all these other wow. things. But mostly people want to talk about uh, either Anna, Animaniacs and a, a character I used to play on Animaniacs. I was mostly a writer for Animaniacs, so but mostly they want to talk about. Mr. Director Clown Man, <laughs> the one like this. <laughs> and, and so it's like, hi, are you are you the are you the the guy that did the clown? And I yeah. And then and then you know, you after you do that for about five hours on a Saturday, you you want a nap. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Is that so natural just to jump into that character? Yeah, well, for Jerry Lewis it is, because I was raised in um I was raised in Vegas. And um, Jerry Lewis was a headliner at the Sands Hotel. So I was a huge, I mean, I was, I'm a crazy Jerry Lewis fan, all of his movies. And uh, they made me laugh. And um, it's just something I picked up. I mean, yeah. uh, probably I was a very annoying, like 13 year old <laughs> kid going, <laughs> how, how, how. <laughs> but uh, so I can just imagine my teachers hated me. Okay, so yeah, so you grow you grew up around um that. So did you go to like school or anything? Did you do theater or in high school, college or anything? I'm sorry, you cut out there. I don't. Oh, sorry you... about that. Yeah, yeah. Go, go, go ahead. Ask the question one more time. Sorry. I was like, yeah. Did you do theater in high school or college or anything? Nope, nope, nope. Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> I yeah, uh, I was not in theater, but I I was a. Uh, and then in college, I majored in like script writing, which is a very mm. stupid thing to major in because you could do that at the house. And <laughs> and there's absolutely you will learn. I mean, I don't know if we have any script screenwriters out there, but just open a book, watch a movie and do that, um, right. which is basically <laughs> it. Um, but then when uh, when I was like 20, 22, um, I joined an improv group. Uh, in in LA called the LA Connection, um, and then from and then I was with them for a couple of years, and I loved it. I loved everything about improv. I loved I loved not having to learn lines and to just you know show up and and um, which is why a lot of the stuff that I write is is very improv-y or um, you know like Freakazoid or or the stuff I wrote on Anna and I mean X. It's all very just kind of like. Story is not my strong suit, but weirdness is. So, uh, so yeah, I was I was basically improv, then sketch comedy. I wrote a lot of sketch comedy, and we we put put it up in front of an audience. And um, and when they were developing Animaniacs, they came and saw the show because they knew they wanted Animaniacs to be a very like you know, very fast paced yeah. sketch sketch feel. So that's um, so they hired me. And that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah, that's my that's my very long winded way of, yeah, you, uh, of, that's, of answering your question. That's amazing. So you just been putting in the work all that time and then like it just transitioned into the animation world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's funny. I had uh, my wife and I had been married maybe a year and um, struggling actors. You know, I was out auditioning and I was out, you know, buying costumes for the show and my wife was a social worker. So she would, you know, she basically paid the way I felt guilty. Like I'm, I'm, I'm literally a thrift store buying silly clothes and my wife is fixing the world uh, and paying for it all. So, uh, but, but yeah, then it was like the an animation, uh, specifically that Warner brothers animaniacs, kind of tiny tunes kind of energy was uh was exactly right so it was right place right time because i love mm -hmm. i love i love that stuff i'm a big bugs bunny daffy duck i think daffy duck is probably the world's most perfect cartoon character because he's so flawed and he's He's just, you know, he he is basically what Homer Simpson is now. But but Daffy Duck was for me 
the best. Um, so yeah, it was sort of like then going to a place where madness and craziness was like, yeah, come on in. We're, we're, we're all nuts in here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, um, unfortunately it's not that way now. Uh, but back in the day, um, it, we were a very silly, uh, Warner brothers was, was very silly. And then with Steven Spielberg as our executive producer, uh, wow. who was, who was really fond of what we were doing, he'd be like, don't you touch my boys like don't <laughs> let them let them go in their room and let them think their thoughts but don't don't get in their way and and I, it's just funny i'm i was like 30 31 no 30 and that was my first real job and from there i was like so i guess it's this way everywhere you go um and, and <laughs> that self-confidence yeah is hot. <laughs> yeah Clearly it wasn't, but, uh, but, but yeah, so, um, it was a magical time. I mean, it was, a uh, Warner brothers nineties, uh, mm -hmm. we could, you know, there was nothing that if we were told, no, we were like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. It was yeah. That's how good. Oh yeah. So it sounded like y'all had a lot of like free will to write back in the nineties. Yeah. And like, if you look at today, you see like the writers going on strike today. I know a strike just got over. So it's like, right. what differences do you see from like the nineties back, the writing back in the nineties to like now? Um, uh, so the biggest difference is I think we had a staff of about six writers, Randy Rogel, who did a lot of the music, Peter Hastings, Dan Oveler. I'm just trying to remember everybody. So I don't forget, uh, maybe six yeah. or seven and um, we would go into Tom Ruger, our executive producer, who, by the way, you should have on because uh, he invented all these shows, That's Batman, the animated Tom. series, all these shows. Yeah. Uh, hey, Tom. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> come on, Tom. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Paul said himself. Come on. Come yeah, on. Yeah. on. Tom, Tom is awesome. And, and I bet he'd do it. But so we, we would go into Tom's office on a Monday morning and say, hey, Tom, I want the Animaniacs to uh to tangle with Einstein or because that's the way the we sort of wrote and yeah. animaniacs it was like they would go against a historical figure um and he go great you've got about seven days uh have a good time see ya and wow. you know we'd, we'd go into our office and everybody else had an office like right next door so you'd start to write maybe you'd write for two minutes and go Ugh, i hate this you get up <laughs> And you'd walk down the hallway to, uh, the, you know, to my friend Peter next door and he's writing something else. And you talk and you sort of, you know, shoot the breeze. And 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 you, and, and that's how we worked for like a week. And there was this commingling of ideas and stuff. And and, you know, then on Monday, the next uh, the next week, we would go ahead and turn it in and, and individually. That's not done anymore. These days, there's a writer's room, right? So you're all, all the writers sit around a table mm -hmm. and you pitch your idea. And if the room, the consensus of the room is we don't like it, they'll change it. And everybody sort of adds on to it before you're ready to, you know, sort of, you know, writing is very personal and you sort of have to get your idea out before yes. people start. Um, that is the standard way now. It is. It, 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 they're sort of a homogenous, um, everybody's in your business sort of, you know, uh, and, and so I, I, uh, and I've written that, that way I had, I came and I just, I don't thrive in that. I'm more of a, I'm going to go in my room. I'm going to make weird Jerry Lewis noises. Uh, you might hear some <laughs> screaming. There might be some crying. I don't know, but don't come in. Um, and, but then before that, so where I would go into Tom and go, yeah, I want Yaka and Wacken Dot to go against Einstein. Uh, nowadays, if I say that, they'd be like, hey, really good, really interesting idea. We'd like you to write. Could you write like three sentences on that? And you're like, well, I just sort of told you what it would be. No, just write three. <laughs> so you go and you write three sentences and then you bring it back and they go, oh, really awesome. Really good. Really good. Really good. Uh, could you now write like five paragraphs about this idea? Like, oh, okay. You write five paragraphs of that. And then you bring it back and they're like, yeah, you know, second paragraph 
is that really going to happen? And and um, so then once that's approved, then you go to an outline. So there's first thing it's called a springboard premise, then a premise, then an outline, which could be four pages of this is exactly what's going to happen in in my cartoon. From there, after that's approved, then you go to script. And I have to tell you from experience, by the time you finally get to script, you you could care less. I mean, you're like, I don't care anymore because oh, there's no there's no spont spontaneity. So the way we wrote, you know, the way I like to write, the way everybody on Animix like to write is it's you're making it up right now, like right now. And you're sort of going and then I can't tell you how many times. I would start a script. I get to like page five and and normally an animated script comes at about 11 to 13 pages, maybe 14. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I'd get to page five and I'd go, no, this is awful. <laughs> and I would, I would throw it out. I would, ch I would change, I would change the entire premise wow. not tell anyone and just because another idea sort of came into my head about it. Um, now, in in modern Hollywood's defense, that can be very expensive, right? So you, right, you can't absolutely. have your writers being like, okay, I'm going to throw it out. But uh, we all knew what was at stake. So it was like, you know, I just threw out four pages. I better, I better really speed this up because they're expecting something and it better be good. Mm -hmm. and, sort of, and sort of that's the other thing. When we would turn in the scripts, uh, if we didn't hear Tom laughing we're dead like uh so so meaning that that's a lot of pressure yeah so it's like you know he wouldn't n not dead like he's gonna come in and yell although that did happen from time to time but but <laughs> just but just that we had failed like and these are a bunch of comedy writers we're sketch comedians and if no one's laughing at your stuff it's like you know <laughs> oh it's a, you know it's a dagger to the heart it's awful <laughs> um Anyway, I, I forget the question because it's, it's, yeah, I'm sorry. No, I, I love that. No, you just, that just shows, like, the different things that go on behind the scenes to produce such an iconic show as Animaniacs. Now, so your credits include writing, producing, and voice acting. Like, how do you, how do you balance those, and do you have a preference of those? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that with the easiest, what can be the easiest, is the voice acting can be like you would ask before about hey do you, does that voice just come naturally mm. if if i'm doing jerry lewis man i'll wear my pjs i'll stroll in i'll you know <laughs> i'll do my thing i'll read the script um but um most of the time you know like some voices i did for well artifius you know sort of artifius from puss in boots and he was always very oh you <laughs> Um, that's, that's so crazy. I, I, happened I had, yeah, I had to read that script backwards and forwards and go, okay, Artipius will go hey, here. He'll go, well, hey, 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 you know, and, yeah. and, um, so, but when you're in the booth and you're with the fellow actors and someone like Andrea Romano, uh, voice director who directed SpongeBob and Animaniacs and Freakazoid and Batman, the anime series, she's amazing. <laughs> she's you know you're you're all having a great a great time you it's just a party you know um right. you you still have to bring you have to do it but it's yeah. a party so but writing a script is for me painful horrible awful sad lonely beating your head against a wall going for long walks saying i'll never think of another funny thought and then there's that moment and you go, I got it. And you run in and you write it and it's and it's you're sweating and you're tired. And um, and then you turn it in and they go, yeah, OK, good. This is it. So if you take those two moments of, of finishing a voice se session, it's like, OK, great, great. You finish writing something that works and you're proud of. And it's like, ah, oh. so the rewards of the writing far outweigh in my opinion the voice acting because one is you're 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 creating and that's not to say that voice actors aren't creating they are but uh i think writing has for me a bigger reward which is because it's harder for yeah. me 
definitely right. much more of a mental toll with the writing. Right. Um, <laughs> make me scared to write something. I always dreamed of being the writer one day. <laughs> right. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, back when you first started on An- Animaniacs, you say you work with Steven Spielberg, but yeah. I know around that time he was doing like Schindler's List and yeah. Save It Prior, Private Ryan. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Did you ever get a chance to meet him, talk to him, or hear his thoughts or like what he wanted the characters to be? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, a, a lot. Um, we so when we started Animaniac, so I was sort of hired r- after they had developed it, mm. uh, but Steven was a very big part of the development, and then. Uh, when we would write some, something, and I think at the time that I first started, I think Stephen was filming Jurassic Park. Mm. Um, and uh, we would get me- memos. It would be Amblin to, you know, Tom Ruger uh, or Paul Rugg. And um, he would say, liked this. That was OK. This is great. Hey, I have a great idea. Why don't you try adding this? That mm-hmm. happened a lot. Um, so. He was, and then I think when he went to go do Schindler's List, uh, which he filmed in Poland, I think. Back then, back then there were only VHS tapes, right? So there was no like DVDs or so they would ship him um, VHS tapes of prints that had come back before we edited them of Animaniacs. We would get notes on on it. So Stephen was highly involved in it. Um, And he loved the show he really had a great a great uh time and we would go to amblin not often um not as often as i thought we should go to amblin which is his company which was the coolest place ever you know there's the there's the et model oh oh, amblin is legendary yeah yeah it's just amazing um and when you'd walk in there you'd be like Ah, we're we're making Steven today. It was it was it was always it was all, oh. always great. And and they had a chef on on site mm. who made I kid you not the best French fries I've ever had. So anyway, so when I think of Hamlet <laughs> now, I think of, I think of French fries. And then when they were developing Freakazoid, um, Stephen Stephen is I think came to the team at Warner's and said, Hey, I want to do, I want to do something that's a, like a little Batman. That's a little edgy. That's a little, you know, comedic. So mm-hmm. Bruce, Tim and Paul Dini, uh, who sort of were, were the Batman guys, they, and, and Bruce Tim's legendary and sort of his directing and his style, Batman, the animated series. So Fre- Freakazoid was sort of born out of that thing. Um, but Stephen kept wanting it to be sillier and funnier and more outrageous. And and Bruce Tim, you know, Batman and stuff, he was like, well, I, that's not really my that's not where I yeah. exist. Right. Not I'm really more. Kind si- of right. Right. So uh, <laughs> then the project was literally a, a, one December, I think it was December of 94. It was dropped in my lap. Uh, John um, John McCann's lap and Tom Ruger's lap, and they said, "Guys, uh, we we air in nine months." Uh, we didn't know anything about the show; we knew nothing. Um, wow. And and so we immediately went and met with Stephen, and he goes, "I want you guys to go crazy, to have a great time, go crazy." And Tom Ruger wrote the first batch of scripts and he went crazy. And then Stephen called and said, okay, maybe a little too crazy. Uh, I think <laughs> you've got a little too crazy. Um, but then, but there was a lot of back and forth. And once we really started, um, uh, there was, you know, he would comment, we would do stuff. Um, I remember during one of our meetings, cause Stephen loves old movies. I love old, uh, I love old monster movies. And there was an old movie called The Crawling Eye. And Stephen and I, and I was like, oh, you like The Crawling Eye too? And he goes, yeah, I love The Crawling Eye. And I, and he was like, maybe we do something, a parody with Freakazoid of The Crawling Eye. And I was oh, like, wow. yes. <laughs> so, um, so we did that. And yeah, anyway, the, to That's answer so crazy, your question, he, he was born. very, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was very big. He was a very big part of the show. So. Man, so, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Bob. No, go ahead. You can go. No, because I was just saying, like, man, because he's like one of the greatest directors of all time. And it's like, how did he balance, like, making these great movies and, like, 
being a part of that cartoon. It's like this is crazy. Like I have no idea because by six o'clock at night, I'm ready to watch Wheel of Fortune. I don't right? you know what I mean. It's like I, I don't know. Some people are some people are built differently, but 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 here's what I can tell you about Stephen, and you know because I've met other very fancy famous people, and you're just like oh. Ugh. Stephen <laughs> is precisely the person who he was meant to be, meaning he was meant to make movies. And yeah. um, he's just one of those that's that in the, you know, when God said he's going to make movies, that was it. Um, and and that's how he is. He loves movies, loves television, loves stuff and loves to talk about it. So, um, yeah. Anyway, that's definitely legendary. So what what your years at Warner Bros., were there some moments where you feel like you faced an incredible challenge? Like, it, oh, I didn't know if you can complete it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All, all the time. Mean, well, every time you sat down to the blank page, right? It's like every time it would be like, okay, let's, let's, I have a, I have a script due and I have just the faintest idea. So yeah, Warner Brothers was a challenge, you know, it was, it was always hard. It was, um, we, we, our offices weren't on the lot, weren't at the Warner Brothers lot. We were at, at the, I don't know if you've heard of Sherman Oaks, but we were at the Sherman yeah, Oaks, Gall yeah, we were at the Sherman Oaks Galleria, which is a mall. And there was a, there was a, a low rise building attached to the mall. We were on the 11th floor. And sometimes when when you're like when you couldn't think of anything, we would all go down in the elevator and there was an arcade down there. And we got very good at foosball, uh, very good at um, air hockey. Um, we'd spend hours down there. But what's interesting is and back then, I hate to admit this, but back then we all smoked. Right. It was like <laughs> we we had cigarettes all the time and we couldn't smoke in the office. So we had to take the elevator down go out and there was this little courtyard and we would all smoke our cigarettes. Oh, wow. And I can't tell you how many times, like when you're like, Oh, I need a cigarette or something. And, and you were struggling with a problem. Like what happens next in the story? You get in that elevator, you go down, you, you go to the courtyard, you smoke and invariably, and this isn't because of cigarettes. It's just because the mind was doing something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. Invariably half, halfway through be like, Oh, I got it. And, you know, mm. you put the cigarette out and you run back and you, you sometimes you wouldn't wait for the elevator. You run up the steps and you go. So. um, So I don't think there was ever any time at Warner Brothers where th there's something we thought we couldn't do. A lot of things we tried. Uh, uh, I try. I wrote a pilot for the Daffy Duck primetime show, which was basically. Oh, wow. Uh, Daffy had a t had a had a had like a variety show and and. um. It was a really fun, uh, it was a really fun project, but that's when things at Warner Brothers started to change. They became um, the WB, uh, and then yep. uh, a lot of people in suits sort of were making decisions. And um, and I think Warner Brothers, Disney has certainly done this properly, and and all that. But I don't think Warner's ever really nurtured bugs and daffy and kept them safe and kept them in everyone's consciousness and some you know they would just let them go for 10 years and stuff and uh yeah anyway so yeah, yeah uh yeah i think th things have definitely absolutely changed like with cartoons and one bros over the years they went from like the wb to the cw nah right yeah, 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 yeah. so many so many factors but so i wanted to ask you about manny the uncanny How yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was the inspiration behind that character and, and, and the live action portrayal on Disney and yeah. the Acme Comedy Theater? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When uh so when I was when I was at Acme um in our shows, in our sketch comedy shows, I would always begin the second act as Manny the Uncanny. And it's this it based on like a a Russian cruise ship entertainer, <laughs> but back when the Soviet Union was still the Soviet Union. So um he was a Russian, a Russian cruise ship entertainer who was called a mentalist. He would sort of like do card tricks and, but he was awful, like the world's <laughs> worst. And, um, and I came up with a bit where I would ask the audience as many of the uncanny who talked in this way. And <laughs> I would, 
I would ask the audience, I'd say, hey, give me your name. And I would have a whiteboard and they go, my name is Aaron. I say, okay. And I'd write Aaron down. And then I would ask someone else in the audience, now give me a forest creature. And they'd say squirrel. So then in the worst horrible way possible, I would take the, the word Aaron and I would, I would <laughs> change it into a fox, but it was not good. It was not, it was awful. <laughs> and, uh, but the audience really, really liked it. So when, when Peter Hastings um, went over to Disney uh, to develop one Saturday morning, he called and he said, I got it. What if we just send Manny out on adventures to talk to people? And um, it's really funny because I was like, yeah, fine, I'll I'll do anything. I don't care. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes, well, we have to pitch it to the Disney brass. So uh, Peter and I were kind of new to this sort of thing. So yeah. I dressed in my full costume, which was a ridiculous, and my hair was straight up. And um, we went into this conference room filled with Disney executives. Now, to tell you that these guys were like this. <laughs> <laughs> the stale face staring at us right and there's like maybe 15 people like like this and yeah oh wow and mm. uh and i had to come in as many the can because that's what peter and i talked about i'd i'd come in and introduce myself and it was a small conference room so i got real close and i was like hello i'm many the can and and uh, <laughs> And they, their faces looked like they hated me with all of their souls. Uh, and they wanted me to go away. So Peter and I did the whole thing. We left. We stayed in the hallway. And one of the execs came out. And he goes, look, um, I don't know if you guys have done this before, but uh, never do that to executives ever again. Uh, oh, because, wow. Uh, That's don't crazy. Ever... And they said something like, don't ever put us in a position where we have to laugh. And I was like wow so that went horribly but they were like okay fine you can do manny the and canny so um yeah that's how manny came up manny was just this you know it's one of those stupid things where you're like watching television you're like man i'm gonna do a character based on that um manny was a lot of fun um and we uh then we went all over the country and i would do manny and we went to the boeing factory we went to all kinds of places and um yeah, so that yeah, that's Manny. Man, you just Manny. done so much. That's crazy. <laughs> Man. Yeah, but so I want to take it back a little bit. So you say you grew up doing improv. Um yeah. what got you to improv and what kind of improv you did? Because I know there's different types of improv. Yeah. Um uh so what got me to improv was uh two friends of mine were like, Hey, you're really weird. Uh we want we're gonna take you to this improv thing. And I was like, <laughs> Okay, because I don't think I would have ever done it myself, because I'm generally like, you know, I'd much rather sit home and and uh, and watch t TV than actually do anything. So uh I went and just discovered I liked it. So back then, you know, it's it's typical improv, like uh you know, gamey improv where it's like, you know, these are two characters. Uh, where are they? They're mm -hmm. from the moon. All right, right. great. And uh, <laughs> what we're going to do is they can only say uh, if they do a scene, we're going to it's called alphabet. And and it's uh, if he does it, a uh, first line, it's got to be a and then it's followed by B. And anyway, it was that sort of stuff. And OK, it was OK. But my favorite type of improv is uh, where, you know, you just get up on stage, two people or three people, look at the audience and say, uh, what's going on here? And they'll be like, you're, you're at a grave. And oh, so you let the audience choose for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and the audience says you're That's at so a grave. Tough. And then you sort of look at each other and you go. All right, let's let's do this scene. And um, and what I really like about that is your heart's pounding. You know, you're like, blah, 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 blah. Um, <laughs> and you get this adrenaline rush because people are staring at you, and they're like, "What are you guys gonna do?" Right. But but that to me is like you know sport. Like that's like you know, that's horrifying yeah. sport. One hundred percent. And it sort of gets your, uh, it, it got me, you know, thinking and, mm. and, uh, so that's what it was. It was sort of that, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, um, and you're working with other people that don't know either, but in improv, mm -hmm. there's some tricks you can use, which is just keep building. Like if I say, Hey, it's a great day out there. Then the next person 
just as you're going and can can say, yeah, but uh, my car got rained on. Uh, you know, I mean, just mm-hmm. sort of like you sort of build, and then all of a sudden you discover what you're doing. And um, right. So that that was for me. Uh, that's the sort of improv I did. Okay, that's that's some scary improv. Um, because yeah. you have you ever seen the movie Ted? Yes. You you remember that improv scene where it's like. Ted and his butt friends in the um crowd just throwing out some like crazy stuff like yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah like like what if you get something like that like what would you do like uh you just go for it you go for it. and let me tell you something about improv an audience uh is so much more liable to be like they're just making it up it's fine right so it's uh-huh. like but if you write something that's the same exact scene the same exact scene and you say, I wrote this, and you do it, they'll be like, yeah, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? So, but, but when people know you're just sort of making it up, they're like, it's fine, right? Right. <laughs> um, so there's this immediate buy-in. Um, I did a, when I worked for the Jim Henson Company, or, or did puppeteering for them, we did improv with, with the Henson puppets, you know, like, mm-hmm. uh, and, um, and that could be really scary because you're not only holding the puppet up because the way the Henson puppets work is, you know, you put them above your head and there's yeah. a camera there that's just showing them. And and you look down at a monitor to see what you're looking at. And and so combining that with improv, I always found to be like really yeah. scary. But uh, but yeah, arm improv, for that. yeah, yeah, yeah. You just sort of go like that the whole, right. the whole time. I got it. But, you know, it's funny. A lot of people in voiceover, uh, in animation, they are all, they're a bunch of improv people. A lot of them. Mm. Wow, that's crazy. So how do you, how do you navigate implement, implement that comedic material and timing into animation? Uh, well, into the writing, the way we wrote uh, Animaniacs uh, was you include everything in the script. So rather than you're just writing the dialogue or, you know, wacko writes across the room, you literally write exterior, water tower, morning, close on shield, the Warner Brothers shield. Um, And then you say and then you say next shot and you literally call every shot. So now camera pulls out from shield. uh, Pause. We hear a rooster in the background. Jeez. Reverse angle on rooster, mm. point of view of water tower. So when I first started, like when I got my first script, I'm like, I never, you're never, I can't, I don't know how to do all this. But, but after a while, you, you, you realize, wait a minute, I'm in charge of the camera. Like, and and yes, the storyboard artist, the director might eventually change what you had said, mm-hmm. but it means that you've got the joke right there in your hand and you're in charge of it. And no one, like when you say the camera sees Wacko with his pants down, uh, <laughs> that's that's when you choose to reveal the joke, right? So it's like wherever the camera is. Um, and that's something I learned at Warner Brothers, which was like, you can control and and you can say everything like Dr. Scratch and Sniff angrily, you know, what are you doing? Beat (laughs) angle on, you know, Yakko. You're, you're like, you're creating it on paper. (laughs) Um, So, so that's how, I mean, you're basically, you're putting it all there. You are literally saying everything. Uh, As Tom Ruger said, when I first started, everything you hear, everything you see. I went in on that pa- paper. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. Um, so building off that, I remember one particular episode from the Maniacs, and the Maniacs, um, it was a joke where it's like, he asked one of the brothers, like, you can wish for anything you want. And then another popped up. So it's like, were you like in control for those like adult hidden jokes? Or it's like, how, how do y'all like put those in a cartoons? Uh, yeah, yes. I mean, so we have been accused of being a little naughty at times. <laughs> and, and to be honest with you, we were just playing around. You know what I mean? We we're like, mm-hmm. we, we, we certainly didn't ever want to scandalize kids. Right. And, 
We always wanted to keep it clean, but we always knew that there was a parent or a teenager that was probably maybe in the room too. And we wanted to say, hi, (laughs) Hi." it's like, uh, which is another Warner Brothers way. Like Mm -hmm. Disney, as much as I like Disney, but Disney, when they make, you know, one of their TV shows, the animated, it's speaking specifically to kids, right? Right. Um, And it's, and it's, and Warner Brothers, or back in the day when we did it, we spoke to the whole room. Mm -hmm. Like, and so sometimes we'd throw in adult stuff, not adult as in not or anything, just an adult joke that they might not Uh, understand. Right. And, um, and so that, that, that six year old be like, you know, I don't, why was that funny? <laughs> right. I was that six year old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But the but the the eighteen year old over here is like, ah, uh, yeah, same. <laughs> let me let me let me tell you why that's funny, right? So it's like it was like it was this whole you know it's how I learned. It's how you know maybe you guys learned. It was like someone said, well, that's funny yeah. because of this, and um. And I think if if you can look at the landscape today, especially with children's animation, that's gone because they speak only specifically. If it's a show for a four-year-old, they will only tell that four-year-old specifically what that four-year-old understands without sort of saying, hey, you can aspire to trying to understand what that joke is over here. You know, right. um, and, and so... Um, I, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a flaw. Like we're, we're treating kids as a lot dumber than they are. And, um, cause kids are, you know, kids are sponges. They want to learn. Yeah. Right. They want to learn stuff. And, yeah. um, but yeah. Yeah. I don't think the demographics for these shows are as wide as they used to be. No, you, you're, you're right. And I think it's because, streaming ser- services you can go exactly to where you where you want to be right yeah. where back in the, the day with animaniacs you know we were airing off of fox so it was like you know you had to show up then and everybody had to show up <laughs> then so yeah. yeah so eventually you transitioned into puppeteering and yeah. you mentioned it earlier your work with the jim henson company can you talk about your work on the Sam Planning Cavalcade action show plus singing. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a really stupid thing we did. Yeah. So I was um, right when we wrapped Freakazoid, uh, Henson wanted to meet with me and I met with them and they, they were like, hey, um, Brian Henson is starting this improv group for his puppeteers because he thinks they're getting a little stale in comedy. And, right. and I go, oh, OK. Um, he goes, so would you show up at these puppeteering on Wednesday nights, this improv thing, and maybe just be a part of the group? You're not a puppeteer. And, and but, you know, just and I was like, yeah, sure. Um, so I showed up one uh, one Wednesday. And I'm with the world's best puppeteers, and I, you know, That's like crazy. Alan Troutman and Brian Henson and just these amazing puppeteers. And I'm sitting there going, why am I here? I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> and our dire- the director of the group said, okay, Paul, you get up. And I was like, no, no, I don't. I, I have no idea how to puppeteer. <laughs> and they're like, get up there. So they, there were like 80 puppets on these racks and you would grab one and then you would, you would, you would do an improv scene with it. And I, and I grabbed a penguin and it had no arms. It was just a mouth. So I like, I, I think I can do that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, based on that, I sort of, uh, I sort of, uh, they, they invited me back and they, and they taught me pup- puppeteering. They're like, well, we're gonna, you know, we'd love to teach you how we do this. And, um, and I said, you're making a horrible mistake. You don't mm-hmm. want to teach me how to do this. Cause I can't do this. Um, <laughs> and, um, and the Sam plenty, when my daughter was young, we didn't let her watch television um, because uh, I was in the business and I was like, no, nope. <laughs> you're not, you know, <laughs> you're not going to watch television. I don't blame uh, you. But, but she could watch old movies and, um, and we would watch old movies together. I mean, again, she was like four or five and um, we started watching these old Westerns from like, I'm going to say 39 or something, 
uh, that that were Western science fictions. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and it was like cowboys and aliens, you know, 60 years before cowboys and aliens was a thing. <laughs> um, and I go, man, I would love to do that. So I, I pitched it to Henson. They, they said, well, here's a hundred dollars. Try, yeah. try, no. try, try, try to make it for that amount of money. And, um, and I just, all the puppeteers in the company acted in this stupid, dumb, um, it was called Sam Plenty. And it was sort of my version of that. But, uh, but yeah. And then, you know, working at Henson is like pretty amazing. They, they're in the middle of Hollywood and, and, uh, Brian and his sister, the Henson company and the, the whole company, they bought Charlie Chaplin's old, uh, studio. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Which is which is in the middle of Hollywood, not a great area, uh, but there it there are these gates, and you go and you go through these gates, and I swear it's like Willy Wonka. It's all of a sudden like the gates open, the gates close, and it's like uh, it's this magical like trees and That's it's crazy. just it's amazing. Right. Um, so yeah, so I and I've done a bunch of stuff with them, and and uh, re they're really good. They're very fun people. Right. Have you ever thought about acting? Like, I can see you being like a good, like, because you're such a charismatic <laughs> person. Like, I have, have that. No, ever seriously, he's right. I have. I, I so I like I said the improv, all all that stuff. You know, that's standing up there and doing it. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, I tried when I first started out. I tried auditioning, and there are some people that are great auditioning, and some people that are horrible. I was, I'm the horrible guy, right? Uh -huh. I, you know, when I when I hold copy and I'm like, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and so I realized and I've done acting. But for, for me, the audition process, it's it's just a block for me. Um, OK. And yeah, but, tough, but definitely tough. Yeah. Yeah. Although if someone said, hey, Paul, we want to cast you in that, you know, and once you know you have it, it's like, yeah, OK. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So um, I want to jump up a little bit. One of your more recent short shows is Earth to Knit. Uh, yeah. How, now, with that puppeteering experience, how do you compare that to your past previous animation experience? Um, it's a really good question. Um, the way we did Ned was. Uh, it's almost like Ned was an animated character. So when they cast me, um, and I'll just tell you how the Jim Henson Company holds auditions, and this is sort of speak to uh, all the people going uh, for that character, all the other puppeteers, they're all sitting there in the room when you're auditioning, right? And and I was the first time I was like, that really, this is how you 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 do it. And that I was originally put off, but then I'm yeah. like, no, because there's this family camaraderie thing. And they'll be like, Paul, you know what you should do when you go up? Don't do it like this. Do it like do it like that. And and there's it's not competition. It's hey, may the best person get this because we're all in this together. And um, so uh, with Ned, uh, Brian wanted to do a seven foot tall puppet um Eesh. and he wanted he wanted it to be live he didn't want to be anything he wanted it to be that when a guest came on and we interviewed all kind kinds of guests my favorite was G gina carano who was so funny and it was really fun but there's a big seven foot alien and the guests would come on like stars celebrities would sit next to ned wow. um wow so there were seven of us that were operating Ned. I operated the mouth. Um, Alan Troutman next to me operated the eyes. <laughs> there was someone inside operating the body. There was a, a puppeteers, Donna Kimball in front, op operating his first two hands. Uh, there was um, Ray and, um, no, I'm sorry. I forget the internet, but but they were doing the arms on, on this side. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the way that the, the Ned's head had 50 motors in it, 50 servos, um, and it was a latex head. So the 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 articulation was, you know, you could do it could just it could do anything. Um, yeah. 
So when Brian Henson said I had the part, he goes, now listen, I'm giving you the most complicated animatronic head the Henson company has ever done. Don't blow it. And I was like, oh, great, thanks. No pressure. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I would I, I would go to the creature shop every uh, every day for t two months, eight hours a day. And you put your hand in a. You put your hand in this gimbal like like this, and it's it has an axis that goes like this, an axis that goes like this, an axis that goes like this, an axis that goes like this. And then within the, the glove, my index finger will make an M appear. This finger can be another thing. And over here, you're, you're sort of, uh, there's another rig and you, you can do a smile here. So, Ali. Yeah, so what I, what, what I had to practice was like A, B, C. And in fact, every time I go, Ma, like I, I, my hand still do, does it. Um, and like two weeks in, I'm like, man, I better tell Brian this is just this is not gonna. Thought I'm about quitting? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was like, this looks terrible to me, and but I was trying to make every shape properly. Yeah. Uh, but if we talk like we're talking now, you know, it's like we're talking, and and our lips are just moving fast, right? right. It's like maybe sometimes there will be an M like that, but most of the time it's. Right. So <laughs> one of the pu puppeteers is like, would you stop trying to like bees? Like you want to get close, but that's not how you got to make it smooth. And once I learned that, then it was really smooth. But then on top of that, so I'm doing that. Now we're improv -ing. Now I'm talking to guests and I have a producer in my ear saying, ask him about this or ask him that. Uh, so that got a little hairy. And the first time the seven of us all came together to do Ned, you know, Ned was like, ah, and it looked, it looked awful. But then mm -hmm. given a couple, given a couple days, there was one day where it was, it was a, it was a thing. Like it was, it was all of us seven making this character happen. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. It was, a, it was a really cool experience. Disney, I don't think ever liked the show because we weren't Marvel or nah. uh, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, we weren't Star Wars, but uh, but we had a real a lot of fun. It was a great show to do. Yeah, that's dope, man. Don't worry, Disney's losing money from Marvel now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Man, hearing all these stories, it sounds like you're a great team player. You work with a lot of teams, like uh, improv comedy, uh, or yeah. just voice acting, or like I said, puppeteering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, great team player. But yeah. I got one more question for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is something about you that people probably wouldn't know like or something that you like like what's something about you uh i am a uh i love stanley kubrick i don't know if you guys know who's yes kubrick. the shining yeah yeah the shining 2001 um uh, space odyssey uh, yeah. yeah uh i am a kubrick a file like i will read any book about kubrick i am i am a kubrick uh nut um mm. Because when I was eight, I think, my parents said, okay, well, I'm going to take you to see this movie, 2001. And they didn't know what it was. And uh, we went to the Cinerama Dome in Hollywood, which is this, it's a very famous, it's like, it's, it's just a really cool old movie theater. And we sat in the very front row because we got there late and there are no other seats. Now, I don't know if you know 2001, but you don't want to sit in the front row because yeah, of 2001 because it's... Stuff is, is, <laughs> is happening. And, uh, and I was eight and I remember, uh, I don't think my parents liked the movie. Uh, but I was like, this is, this is the, I don't know what's happening. You know, it sort of speaks to what we were talking about. Like the, maybe the kids don't, don't understand. Like, I didn't know what the heck was happening, yeah. but I was there for every minute of it. I was like, <laughs> yes, this is amazing. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm a big 2001 fan, um, yeah, and which, which I, 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 which I, I think is the best movie ever made, but I could be, I could be persuaded, but I'm pretty sure it's the best movie <laughs> ever, ever made. Yeah. I just don't think they make original IPs like they used to. No, it's all no. remakes. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. So, so one of my last questions is 
you ha- you've had such a long career, done so many projects, and worked on so many things. Uh, at at any point, does your personal life intersect with your career, and how do you balance both? <laughs> well, I think what um, excuse me, um, for me, my family always came first. And in animation, like I had friends writing on sitcoms while I was writing animation and they were, you know, they were getting into the office at 10 and they were leaving the office at three in the morning. And that was like a Mm. Monday to to you. That was like all week. And it was intense and and stuff. And we I I would get into the office early at 7 a.m. and get most of my writing done within the first three hours. And after that, I'd walk around and make fun of people. (laughs) Um, but I was home by five always and, um, generally. So, um, so I think there's a balance to be struck and, uh, you know, you have to, if family comes first and, you know, I mean, yeah, so that's, that was always really important, especially when my daughter was, you know, doing homework and stuff. And I loved to be there to make sure she was getting it done. Because I remember being that age, and I would go hide and not do it. So I was like, yeah, that's <laughs> not going to be you. I love that. Man. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you are you going to be doing or appearing at any cons coming up? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be in Atlanta with Tom Ruger at something called Momo MomoCon. I think it's a four day, uh, mostly animation con. Mm. Um, okay. So we're going to be there. I, it's Memorial Weekend. So I'm not sure when that that is. Other than that, you know, I like putting up stupid videos um, for no other reason than it pleases me and uh, it makes me laugh. So um, but I'm pretty much I, I'm I am I am skidding towards retirement, as they say. So just, yeah, um, really don't have a lot going on other than making my own little stupid videos that I think three people watch. But it makes me happy. So there you go. Well, where, where can we find these videos at? Uh, go to uh, oh right I should I should be better at that uh, <laughs> go to uh, Paul Ruggs Freundleben on YouTube um, you might have seen I had this video with my dog my my uh, Lucky the Chihuahua I don't know if you ever saw it where the dog I say hi it's Paul and I've got my Chihuahua and I say you know a lot of people say how do you relax and I pet my dog and I pet the dog and it bites me and and mm-hmm. anyway that's <laughs> Oh, wow. Wait, the um, I remember seeing something about a dog, a chihuahua, like like a banana or something, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was that was, that, oh, that was you? Okay. Yeah, that was. Oh, me. that's yeah, that crazy. Was me. <laughs> yeah. That's so my crazy. chihuahua and I, my 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 chihuahua and I, uh, I, my friend Tom Wilson. Do you guys know Back to the F- Future? Yes, the- yes. Yeah. We, we met him in the, this summer. Oh, right, right. So Tom uh, is an awesome guy. And Tom's one of my best friends. And he was over at the house and he uh, I was holding Lucky and I was petting Lucky and Lucky was just. <laughs> and Tom's Tom looks at me and goes, Paul, I'm just going to suggest something. And I said, what? And he goes, do a video of that. And I go, what do, what do you mean? He goes, just what you're doing with him biting you. Just do a video of that. And I go, yeah, whatever. Fine. And um. <laughs> So I thought about it for like a month and I was like, Tom doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't know what that means. And so one day I, at the end of a day of writing, I borrowed Lucky the dog and from my wife. And I said, isn't he, is he in a bad mood? And she said, yeah, he's kind of, he's in a bad mood. And I go, perfect. And, um, and I just, <laughs> I just started petting him and he wailed on me and I put it up on Facebook for the three friends that I thought would like it. And then within an hour, it would be a million views. And I was like, wait a minute. Wow. I mean, what are you talking about? It's my (laughs) dog biting me. What is happening? So anyway, yeah, that was my introduction. So you said Biff Tannen helped you go viral. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) Tom is, if you guys met him, you know what a great guy he is. He's just like. He's very kind. He's just. He's the smartest, sweetest, uh, one of the greatest guys. Yeah, he's definitely such a humble guy. I met him uh, back at Fan Expo in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. awesome. He's awesome. Hey, Tom, Tom, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk to Tom. He owes me money. So that's, you know, we got <laughs> this, this will settle the debt. This will settle the debt. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 
Nah, but we want to thank you for having you on. We're gonna go ahead and close this out. We okay. we we really want to have you back. This is such an amazing yeah, yeah. time. Great conversation. Go ahead. Call yes, please. You know where to reach me. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. And you have a good day, man. Okay. Yeah. Take care, guys. Bye. Oh my God, bro. Paul Rugg, ladies and gentlemen. Like, man. Uh, I feel like I just learned so much this episode, man. Oh, yeah, 100%. So, like, any, like, uh, writers that's watching this or listening to this, anybody want to get into Hollywood, movie, films, production, whatever, there's so many gems in this episode, and he yes. took you actually behind the scenes to show you how things operate. And I really appreciate him taking time out of his day to show us, like, yeah, give bro, us knowledge, is, honestly. Such, such a such amazing conversation, man. And just the people he worked with, Brian Henson, man, like Steven like, Spielberg. Bro, Steven Spielberg, like he just said, the man casually threw out at the end of this episode that he's friends with Biff Tannen from Back like, to the Future. Like, what? Like, <laughs> like one of the OG bullies, like. That's crazy, man. One of the greatest movies of all time. Like uh, he just said, that's a friend. Like, wow. But man, like, nah, nah, just in general, man. He man put in so much work for over 30, 40 years, man. And then mm -hmm. bro, I, I already spoke about his filmography in the beginning, but he, he just got so much legendary stuff under his belt. And I'm just glad he came on our little podcast to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> real, man. It's crazy, like he's still putting in work. Like, do you know he was yes. on Teen Titans Go? Uh what? within like the past like Yeah. Oh, uh, what's his name? What's the hero he did? Um Speed, not Speed. What's his name? Uh, with an S. Come on, help Speed me out. Gonzalez. No, 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 no. With an S. The S. Batman dude. He he recreated. He recreated. You the the superhero. The superhero he did start with an S. Superman. No. He the animated. He recreated. Yeah, remember, like Steven Spielberg said, "I want this character to be like Batman and." Oh, what the fuck do you say? Yeah, what is his name? Fuck. Yeah, I, I slipped my mind, man. I slipped yeah, my mind. Yeah, all right. So he was on an episode of Team Titans Go. Like, oh, wow. That just show you how everything came full circle. <laughs> Overall, man, this is just a good episode, man, because I feel like he was so insightful. And this is just a guy that's worked his whole life and done so many crazy projects. And I'm just, I'm glad he came onto our platform because I feel like we got more out of this than anything. Oh, 100%. I feel like the listeners got really a lot out of this, too. So, and this is just, like, another, like, milestone we hit. There's, so it shows the sky's the limit. The stars is the limit for us. So it's like, there's one no year. one year, a year doing this. So it ain't no tell. Like, we want to say that humbly. Humbly. Humbly, look, humbly. We got a year under our belt, and, like, look look what we got to, in our, like, in uh, our it's just, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's just only setting things up, opening more doors. Tell you what, we we gonna be in that room soon. Back, so yeah, make sure y'all stay tuned. All right, that's gonna do it for us today, y'all. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Follow us on Facebook and YouTube at Infamous Ghost Podcast, and you can follow us on Instagram at Infamous Ghost Pod. And you can follow us on Twitter and TikTok at Infamous Goats. Until then, we see y'all next time. Peace. Peace.